Would anyone like to ask me a question? Yes? Uh, in Vim? Yeah. The command to do what again? Ah, uh, yeah, it's, it's either F in the letter or T in the letter. T, so if I say T uppercase U, it takes me up to the letter, and if I say F uppercase U, it takes me forward on top of the letter. And then, of course, you can combine that with the number. 3 fu that kind of thing. That didn't come out right, but um, yes. When we uh, submit a project one, do you want all of the files we worked on just in the submission? Or do you just want one? Uh, as a, you need to submit anything that you worked with in Vim. Okay. And you need not to submit anything that you didn't work with in Vim. So do not submit the .os. Do not submit the executable. Okay, those are useless to me. What I need is the files that you worked on. <coughs> CPP files, .h files, the make file. Yes. Other questions? Yes. I'm sorry, say that again. Well, the make file is just a text file, right? So it it contains a set of rules for making object files and making an executable. But that's fine. I need that make file since you got into Vim and you created that make file. Uh, I don't need the actual object files and I don't need the executable. In fact, I'd prefer not to receive them. Other questions? <clears throat> Okay, uh, I'm not done grading your exam yet. I'm gonna, oh boy, I'm gonna try and have it done by Monday. I'd love to have it done by Monday, but no promises. I'm gonna lose Saturday, so we'll see how far I get uh, on Sunday and getting through them. I got through one page of them, uh, page four. I finished grading. Um, and in case you're wondering, I don't, I don't have any idea who I'm grading when I grade it because I'm not taking your exam and then grading your exam. I'm flipping every single exam open to page four and I'm just grading everyone's page four and I don't see any names, right? Uh, so that makes it more consistent uh, for me as well since I'm seeing the exact same problem 70 times in a row and then I make sure I have consistency in grading there. In case you're wondering about the lifestyle of the uh, academic and famous. Um, what else did I want to say? We, I, so I need to, I actually should have posted assignment seven. I have not done that. Uh, if all goes well, I'll get that posted tonight. So for those who are inclined to get a jump early on things, then um, look to the, the course shell either later this evening or tomorrow, and you might be able to get some initial work done on that assignment. Also, Project 2 will be starting next week. I, uh, I'm thinking Wednesday is probably when we'll start Project 2. So uh, that will have a number of materials to it. And uh, I'll say this on Monday, but I'll say it now as well. You need to go to that project and print out the materials and bring them with you to class uh, prior to the, us kicking that off. So it'll be a lot like what we did with the web counter as far as the quote-unquote authentic materials, the emails. I think it was just, what, one email in that, uh, in that web counter project. This one's going to be four pieces, four documents plus coding standards on top of that. So it's a little more involved. There's going to be some group work on the analysis and design of that. So when we get to it, this is just a heads up that you really need to come to class prepared for that. And uh, those classes are really poorly structured for screencasts. Generally, uh, very little of it is recorded. Uh, so it's to your advantage to attend uh, when we're doing that project. So 
with that as things to look forward to. <clears throat> what I want to do is talk about header files again. So the one thing in the coding standards for this first project that I haven't had time to talk about are that pound if end def and pound define and pound end if that we have in that dot h file and why that's there. It's not a syntactic requirement <coughs> that you put those there. However, if you don't put them there, you tend to run into trouble. Okay? So first, what I want to demonstrate is if I create mm, whatever dot cpp, uh, and actually I'm going to start with whatever. Is that a little low? Can, do I need to raise that a bit? Uh, if I edit whatever dot h, and I'm going to create a class whatever, <coughs> and it doesn't matter what's in it. That'd be private, uh, public. We'll put doesn't matter. Void funk. All right. So this is a again. This is like a blueprint describing what the class is. Should we decide to use it, we're under no obligation to. And for the source here, I'm going to create a main. And I'm going to just leave it empty. I guess I'll put in this return zero. Uh, but what I may want to use that whatever class. So I'll say whatever dot cp. Oops, excuse me. Never ever ever do that. Always only include dot h's. This should actually work. So that this this program doesn't do anything. G plus plus whatever dot cpp and it does work. Okay. Uh, what I want to do is I want to demonstrate with this uppercase e. Does, if everyone recalls the four steps to compiling, the first one is the preprocessor, which are these pound include things. So what we see is I'm going to actually trick this up a little bit. I'm going to say about to include whatever. And then I'll put down here finished including whatever. Now I compile with the dash E option. So this is what the preprocessor does. Again, we can ignore this information. That's just information then for the compiler. But what the preprocessor does is Oh, it gets rid of comments. Haha. <laughs> okay. It ignores comments. We don't see those. I'm going to do that. So again, we're not going to the compiler, so I don't have to worry about this being illegal code because I'm not sending it to the compiler to be compiled. The preprocessor simply ignores that. Third time's the charm. All right. Here it is. About to include whatever. Here is a copy of whatever.h, yes? And then finished including whatever and then the rest of that whatever.cpp. Okay? So that's all the preprocessor is doing. We've seen this before. I can get fancy and I can put this here four times. Preprocessor doesn't care. It will do whatever we tell it to do. And we see it once, twice, three times, uh, four times. So the problem comes when I do it to the compiler. So again, I, I will comment this out. And I, now this, if I send it to the compiler, the compiler will complain about that. So I'll comment that out. So I have my original. I just want to get back to what I originally had, which is my include statement on line two and my program, which actually does nothing. And if I compile it, it'll create an executable just fine. There it is. Uh, but what if I do it twice? What if I include this a second time? So that class declaration, it sees two times now. If I try compiling that, <clears throat> then it complains. 
So the compiler is a little bit finicky. The compiler, I've said this time and time again, before you are allowed to use it, you have to tell the compiler what it is. However, if you get a little bit snooty and you tell the compiler more than once what it is, the compiler doesn't like that. It likes to be told what's what, doesn't like you getting snooty about it. Okay, don't tell it twice or it's going to complain just as it is right here. So um, we need a way of automatically keeping this, from, this behavior from occurring. <clears throat> now you may say, well, I'm, not, I'm, I'm a grown adult and I can be trusted not to do this twice in a row. Uh, yes, you can, but you're going to get to the point where you're including multiple files. So maybe you have another .h that you're including. And if I write another .h, um, another .h has, I don't know, some sort of function prototype in it. Or maybe it has another class declaration. But for whatever reason, you have include whatever .h here. So now let's, now this is something that you become less able to see. You say, I'm going to include whatever .h because I may use it in this code. Oh, I also may use the functions described here, so I'm going to include that. The preprocessor will include a copy of that class declaration. Now it will include a copy of another .h, which is the first thing it does is includes this a second time. Okay. Uh, this will become more and more a problem. I, I'm having a, a difficult time in convincing you this is a problem because you haven't had an opportunity to do this. But I guarantee you, when we get to project two, indefinitely as you go on to other classes, you begin creating projects with more and more files. And you've got these pound include statements both in your CPP files as well as in other header files. Okay? As an example, uh, maybe. Th this may not be so hard to swallow, is maybe in this program I'm going to pound include IO stream, and then maybe in this header file you're doing something with C out, so you're going to pound include IO stream again, right? Uh, IO stream is going to suffer from the same problems that I showed with the compiler, so we need the same strategy to keep IO stream from being included more than once. How do we keep it from being included more than once? Because the period of time when this gets included more than once is with the preprocessor. So we need a way of telling the preprocessor, please make sure you do not include this code more than once. That is where we get to what we saw in the coding standards. So if I go to whatever.h, oops. Oops, I don't want to do that. Um, let me, let me first describe this concept of the preprocessor. Actually, let me go to the CPP to do that. Let me go to a totally different one. Pound, define. I want to define a cool number as 42. And I'm going to write a little program here. And I'm going to say that integer x and x is equal to cool number. Okay. What happens when I run this through the compiler? Anyone want to take a guess at what happens? What does this line do? It assigns 42 to x. Right, it replaces cool number with 42, right? And that's what this define means. I want to define this term as being the number 42, and then anywhere it sees this term, it's going to blindly put the number 42. Now, what's interesting about it is it's occurring at the preprocessor level. So what the compiler actually sees, if I do the dash E, the compiler sees this. This is all that the compiler sees, right? This cool number text is never seen by the compiler. All the compiler sees is x equals 42. Uh, and this is something this is something that's not really done a whole lot in C++. It used to be done all the time in the C language. 
is to uh, do these pound defines because the number 42, to look at it, if I was to write code like this, um, but l let me choose something that's a little more context. Maximum size, I don't know, something like that. If I'm looking at code, so you're, you're, you got tired eyes, you've been working all day, you're looking at thousands of lines of code, and you look at this and you go, I, I don't have the slot, what in the world is 42? But if you saw something like this, at least you have a little bit of context and you'd say, aha, oh, I don't know what max size is, but that obviously is what X is being set to. Right? You see how this is, can be a little more meaningful? And it doesn't have to be max size. It'd be whatever is appropriate to your application. How about uh, largest month? And the largest month is 12. Yeah, something like this. So you're able to use words instead of numbers to make things uh, make more sense when you're just looking at code. So that's the rationale for using it. And then, uh, then the compiler actually sees the 12 and not the word largest month. All right. So I'm also, this is not useful, uh, but I can't, this bit here is actually optional. Uh, I can actually, as far as the preprocessor is concerned, I can define something and not tax something on the end of it. Uh, so just to let you know, that's optional. The preprocessor doesn't care. This just makes the term largest month known to the preprocessor. So I look at whatever dot h. The way the coding standard goes is if def blah, or excuse me, if ndef define blah. As far as what this is simulating, this is simulating an if statement in the language, and what the end means is not. So it's saying, if blah is not defined, then do everything up until the point where you see the end, the end if. If blah is defined, then it goes from line 1 to line 10. Let's just, oh shoot, okay, I did say that. Let's just put it in some C++ code. If not defined blah, I'm going to define blah, and then I'm going to say happy days, and then I'm going to say end if. And then I'm going to say again, if blah is not defined, I guess I could do the exact same thing. More happy days. And if. So, I'm the preprocessor and I'm compiling code.cpp. I hit line one. Is blah defined? No, it's never seen it before. So it defines blah. Now blah exists as far as the preprocessor is concerned. It goes ahead and ignores happy days, so that gets spit out to the compiler. Uh, then the end if, okay, it's done with that. Cruises a little bit, hits line six. If not defined blah, is blah defined? Yes, so it immediately jumps to line nine. So the effect is that the preprocessor will do that, well, spit this out, but it's going to totally skip this here. Let's try that. So I should see happy days, sort of happy days, and then it's going to totally skip this stuff here because this is what I would call false. This is true, so I'll do this. This is false, so I'll jump down to here and then everything after. Let's have a look. Let me get rid of some of these blank lines so it's easier to see. G++ minus uppercase E. All right, here's my preprocessor. Happy days, the sort of happy days, and then here is where we had more happy days, so the preprocessor totally skipped that. So that means that the code that's seen by the compiler is the stuff 
that we had wrapped around it the first time, this wasn't wrapped around anything, and if it, it skips the stuff after because it's already defined and then it just keeps going. So what is the effect of putting that in whatever dot cpp about to include whatever finished including whatever and now I'm going to do this four times. Let's look at whatever.h. If blah is not defined, define it and let all this happen. Here's our end. I run it through the preprocessor. About to include whatever. Now I include it four times. Here's the first time. And it ignored all the other ones. Okay, so you see this is protecting me from myself. The compiler complains if it sees this. Oops. The compiler complains if it sees this class declaration more than once. This nice little preprocessor recipe, if you will, makes it so that it's impossible for us to include it more than once. That's the reason why we have that in there. The next thing to ask, or the final thing to ask about this, is why? what should we put here? I put blah. The problem is I start having a hard time remembering what exclamations I've said. So I'm going to use blah, I'm going to use bleat, I'm going to use blech, I'm going to go yuck. But if i got a thousand header files, I'm going to pretty soon run out of explanation, uh, exclamations. And may, I'll go to pronouns, and then I'll use me, you, they, them. That gets me to about 10 or 12 files, and I've got about 900 more to go. Okay, you see the problem. You have a hard time remembering this, these terms that you're using. So what has become customary is just use the name of the file, because the name of the file is unique to that file. And I'll call it whatever.h. The last thing that's a bit of a hassle is that the preprocessor doesn't like this period, so I replace the period with an underscore. So that's why in the coding standards, when it was using the example of date, it said date underscore h. Because it's a symbol, I'd call this a symbol, for the preprocessor that will be unique to this file. So that's by convention. You can go with blah and bleat and they and them if you want. I mean, you know, go by your own tune there. Uh, but most programmers are going to do what you see here because, you know, it makes sense. Right, when you use it in different programs, that can be an issue. So you may, you may be cool and you can say, yeah, Todd, with your limited vocabulary and your three pronouns that you're using, I'm, I'm going to do it because I know a lot more pronouns than you. But the problem is you're going to, uh, someone's going to take your header file and use it in their own program and maybe they're using pronouns for something totally different and now you've got issues. Whereas it's... So it just comes back to standardization. It's standardization, yeah. Convention. Any questions? What's confusing about it? Yes? So would you do the same thing for iostream? Ah, thing for iostream? So that's an interesting question. Uh, iostream was written by someone else, okay? And it was written several years ago. Uh, but they are as powerless against the forces of the compiler as we are. So if you go look, dig through the system, and you actually find IOStream, you'll see this exact thing. They've already done it. Any, any, header, any standard header file you include, you'll find this. Other questions? Yes? No. Okay. So this only applies to header files. Only applies. Yes. The, these. This recipe, if you will, lines one, two, and ten, 
uh, you'll only find this recipe in header files. And you'll find it in every header file, without exception. Yes? Do you have to do this as well in the, do you have two header files as well? For the way I'm going to say this, right? There's the cpp.h and then the other So again, this is peculiar to header files, so I don't have any such thing in the .cpp file. The reason is, so the mechanism, keep in mind, the mechanism where we run into trouble is the preprocessor pound including multiple files. And I've said, never, ever, ever pound include a .cpp file. So you should have no need of doing this around a .cpp file because you're going to be a good programmer and not pound include a .cpp file. One of the... Uh, one of the problems that programmers have when they're first learning this stuff is they're a little bit confused about saying G++ and putting a whole bunch of CPP files on one line. And so you occasionally see a person who's going to say G++ and they just have one file.cpp. And I'm going, how does this thing work? And I open up that CPP file and the way they made it work is they pound included their other 13.cpp files. Um, but that's just that's just a recipe for trouble for all kinds of reasons. Yeah. Oh, line seven. Yeah, that. So in whatever dot cpp, I would have the definition to the function I've declared on line seven. Yeah, yeah. I'd have three files. So I I, I was a little bit. Uh, where am I? We want, let's see, no. All right. Uh, so, really, I shouldn't, I called this whatever.cpp. What I should have put here is whatever func, and then I should have defined the function here, and then this main would be in a separate file. So, the way this, this would look just like everything else, I would have had. Let me go back down to one. Uh, what do I call this? Whatever.cpp. So here I'd have to pound include whatever.h. And then this would be in a totally separate file here where I'd probably be creating one of these things. And in which case, if I'm going to use it, then inside of this file I would have had to have pound included whatever.h. Any other questions? Okay. Yeah. The the recipe to get everything to paginate indent correctly according to the code is gg equal g in vim type to have your code uh, format slash indent correctly. And would you have to do that for every file you create, or once you do that, it's just... It's, it's, uh, it would have to be for every file. What will happen frequently is, <clears throat> where I end up using it a lot, is I will go, I'll, I'll write, uh, I'll write a bunch of code, and maybe I, I've got some sort of for loop here, and I put this in a for loop like this, and then I write a bunch of other code and go, whoops, that should all be in a loop. So I, I take these three lines and I put them in here. Now my indenting's messed up, and uh, if I don't want to fix it manually by doing each line individually, I'll just say gg equal g, and it'll go ahead and fix that. That's the typical scenario where I end up using it. Okay. Yeah, it's it's yeah, and again, this is it, all this indenting, of course, is just for our visual enjoyment, right? The compiler doesn't care. Uh, I I don't know if I, I've shown this, but I you really need to emphasize that the compiler doesn't care about spacing. So here's my C out less than less than high there. 
Okay, so let me provide two ways of spacing this. There we go. My entire program is essentially on one line. I think I run into a problem if I put that on the pound include statement, uh, but it's been long enough that I'll go ahead and find out. Yeah, the, the preprocessor doesn't like that. But this is, this is fine. I can put this program on one line. G++ program.cpp. Compiler's happy with that. Uh, I can also put it on many lines. So Right. So if I wanted to be really correct in what I said about semicolons, it would not be, be sure to have a semicolon on the end of the line. The correct way of saying it is be sure to have an, a semicolon at the end of your statement. Because you can see that the only reason we tend to have one statement per line is for our, for our eyes. The compiler doesn't care. So here I put everything on its own line. And the compiler is perfectly happy with that because it doesn't care. Any other questions about that? Before I throw in one last topic for the end of the day? Okay. The spacing is really crucial in things like grain files. Uh, spacing, yes, yeah, so spacing is a different matter with the make files. So, specifically, it's following a convention where it needs to see a tab before each shell command, in essence, that it will do under a rule. Yeah, uh, and, and it isn't this way with all programming languages. One of the things you find as you go through the program, you start learning other programming languages, and you learn what's the same and different about programming languages. So, another programming language, Python has no concept of curly braces, but spacing is paramount. So if I want to create a for loop in Python, um, I would do something like this. And oops, there are no semicolons, by the way, in Python. Uh, and the way Python knows where the end of this loop is, is when I stop indenting. And if I, in Python, if I create a function, then it knows where the end of the function is when I stop indenting. Okay, so the spacing, it, it, this is the kind of thing that's peculiar to the programming language you're using and will be different. Uh, the idea of having integers, floats, chars, that's peculiar to programming languages as well. You want me to create a variable in Python? A equals 5. You want me to create another one? B equals Todd. There you go. I don't have to say that it's an integer or a string. I just use the darn things and they magically come into existence. Okay. Um, different programming languages have different, and there are no semicolons. I'm having a hard time with my semicolons in Python here. Uh, so, yeah, different programming languages are, are going to have different characteristics. Uh, what is the advantage? Why would I choose Python over C++? And something that takes me a day to code up in C++ could probably take me an hour in Python. You can whip out code super fast in Python. What is the disadvantage to Python? It runs much more slowly. Now a lot, and so why would I ever choose Python if it runs much more slowly? Because a lot of times the speed of the application doesn't matter. So if it takes me Half a second in Python to sort a list of a million things instead of one one thousandth of a second in C++. Who cares? You know, I don't care if it takes one one thousandth of a second versus half a second. That's no big deal. Uh, there are times where performance is critical, in which case I'd go the slower route of C++ and slog through the longer time to develop because it's going to be really quick. Uh, there are situations where I want to run code and in C++ it takes a day to run but it takes six months to run in Python. Let's use C++. All right. So this is all the kind of stuff that you learn as you go through the program. Not, not the program you code up in the computer science degree program. All right. Any other questions? Okay. 
Uh, so I don't need any of that. I'll leave that there. I want to talk about. I'm gonna actually. Uh, I'm gonna actually code this up for real. So whatever dot h has an integer called, it doesn't matter. Then it's going to display it. Uh, no, I need to actually need to. I want to provide a little context here. So I have a file called person.h. I'll do that. I'm going to call this person. And what this person has is an h. And then I have a function to display. Okay. I'm going to go to person.cpp. I'm going to pound include person.h. Oops, what do I have this called? It's in lowercase. And I'm going to write, again, I, let me look at it. I'm going to write this function. I'll do a little copy and paste to help me out. This function is not a normal function. It is part of the person class. So I need that. And what it's going to do is see out age is colon, and I'm going to print out that age. OK. That's it. A little a one trick pony. Any person I create has an age, and the only thing I can do with it is display it. All right. And I wrote this function to simply spit this out to the screen. So let's write a program. Uh, pe people program. I need to pound include person.h. And now I can put this. And I'm going to create a person. Uh, teenager. Oops, teenager.display. Can anyone tell me? Well, let me run it. I have an G person prog person.cpp and uh, people prog.cpp. Whoops, what it uh, doesn't like. I guess I don't need that. I'll get rid of that. All right. Let me run it. Again, let's look at the program. I'm going to create a person, and I'm going to display that person. Wow. Why is that? Yes? Because that's um, something that was stored in the memory that's being used by H. <clears throat> right. So I always... Draw that diagram of the railroad track. Oh, and it's because we did initialize the And this is person create dot and I want to do that here. Oops, is that right? Yeah, I did all that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so when I on when I, when I do line 7 and I create person, then what it does is it finds enough memory for, what does every person have? Age. And this particular person is called teenager. Okay, so it creates a teenager, and that teenager has an age. Teenager could have an age and a name and a GPA 
and I would go ahead and say that all of this here is part of teenager. Uh, but I didn't create those extra ones. Anyway, what happened is that this number right here is what was stored. One, six, nine, two, five, four, three, whatever that number was. That number is what happened to be there when I created this teenager. Because by creating it, it, it doesn't set aside memory for it and then scrub it nice and clean for it, for us. It just sets aside memory for it. If we want to put something in there, that's our job. Okay, so this is, that is what's happening here. It creates this thing, sets aside memory for this person's age, but it doesn't scrub it clean. Whatever was in there last Tuesday or three seconds before is the number that it assumes. And what I'm doing is I'm printing that out without changing it. Every time you run it, most times when you run it, it should be different. So this is now 174, this was 163, I can run it again. Here's 162, why is it different every time? Every time I run it, the program just looks for some memory out there that's free and says, okay, I'll put teenager right here. And next time I'll put teenager right here, right? And so it's just setting this thing up in different locations. And who knows what's in that? It, it, this stuff looks like your closet, right? You got to clean it if you want it to be good. So what we need is we need something to happen here to make sure that we clean up the memory that we're using. That's our, my image. Um, I need a way of making this a known value whenever I create a person. Now we could create a set function. We could say set age and call that, but I'd like it to happen automatically. And there is something to, that does that. It's called a constructor. Constructor, often abbreviated CTOR. What this is, is it's a special function that gets called whenever I create a person. And what's interesting about it is how does it know, how does the compiler know that it's a constructor and this function should be called when you create it? It knows it because it has the exact same name as the class. So the name of my class is person. Let me call this function person. There's one more peculiarity here. You do not specify a return type. We'll talk about that later because I'm about out of time. So that's how I declare that it exists. Now in the remaining 120 seconds, I'm going to write the function. That's the name of the function. It's going to have curly braces, just like every other function. What class is this function a member of? The person class, yes? So just like here I said person colon colon, here I have to say person colon colon. Let's set the age equal to zero. This And let me put a little statement in here. Yay, I'm in the constructor. Okay. Let's look at this real quick. Right here, line seven, let me say C out, about to create teenager. C out, mission accomplished. Okay, everyone with me? Compile this mess, run it. About to create teenager. Yay, I'm in the constructor. Mission accomplished. Now my display statement, and it set it to zero, just like I did. So a constructor is a wonderful, wonderful type of function to have because it is guaranteed to be called whenever you try to create it. It is impossible for me to create a person now without running that function. That means that anytime anyone creates a, a person object, I know that my age will be at least initialized to something that we know. Hmm? Secret word. Secret word. Ooh, thanks. Secret word is uh, is, is 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 quotidian. Okay. No mocking the secret word. 
of or occurring every day daily All right, go ahead and look to the uh, course shell for assignment seven to be posted.